It's a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome Jan Werner Müller, who is the keynote speaker for the conference which uh, the Graduate Institute and the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna are organizing conjointly on the theme, Has Europe Reached Its Limits? Jan Werner begged me not to list his numerous publications, so I'll confine myself to saying that he is a professor at Princeton University and this year a visiting fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in uh, Vienna, and he is the author of numerous uh, books and articles. Um, Without further ado, let me pass the floor on to Jan Werner. Thank you very much for this mercifully brief introduction. The big problem today is populism. Thus said Hermann von Rompuy in an interview in 2010. Six and a half years later, ladies and gentlemen, of course, we still hear and read every day that in Europe the big problem is populism. True, what Nigel Farage recently described as a tsunami that was now going to basically crash over Europe, Brexit first, then Trump, then Hofer, and so on and so forth, it didn't quite happen, as you know. Austria, this past Sunday, did not become the first West European democracy to elect a far-right president. But what Farage, slightly mixing metaphors here, described as the Italians firing a bazooka at the establishment, of course, in the eyes of most observers, did happen. And just to reinforce the sense of the result of Sunday in Italy having sort of been part of this sense of a continuous development movement across the West, none other, none other than Matteo Salvini sent out a tweet which simply said, Viva Trump, Viva Putin, Viva la Le Pen, et Viva la Lega. So that's about as threatening as it gets in terms of having this image of a continuous tsunami wave, dominoes falling, whatever metaphor you might <coughs> think of. So in terms of the question that has been posed for our conference, you might conclude, against the background of this image, that yes, in a certain way, Europe has reached its limits. And the limits turned out to be the peoples of Europe itself. That essentially, what from the beginning had been a process of integration by stealth, as our distinguished colleague Gian Domenico Maione famously put it, basically finally reached its limits when the peoples themselves woke up and started to, again going back to Farage's metaphor, started to fire bazookas against the establishment. Or put a bit differently, in the words of another distinguished colleague, the uh, Dutch scholar Kaz Müde, we basically are now confronted with a situation where non-democratic liberalism across Europe is facing illiberal democratic masses. This image, ladies and gentlemen, I think is in many ways actually misleading. And while it's become very popular already to paint all kinds of apocalyptic scenarios, about where we're gonna go from here, which limits we're gonna hit next in 2017, I wanna try, perhaps in vain, to paint a somewhat more positive, maybe even uplifting picture to you tonight. And I'll try to do so in three steps. First of all, I want to offer a very brief definition 
of what populism actually is, partly to counter what I see as an absolutely inflationary use of the word populism, often because of sheer lazy thinking, but also sometimes for clearly ideological purposes. Then in the second step, I'll say a few words about what I take to be the main causes of populism today in Europe specifically. I won't talk about the US. If you like, we can talk about that later in the, in the discussion. And then thirdly, and here hopefully is the uplifting part, I want to suggest three ideas or strategies of how one can counter populism in our day and age. So, on to the first chapter of the, of, of the talk. What exactly is populism? Well, contrary to what we hear and read every day, not everybody who criticizes the elites or the establishment should automatically be counted as a populist. And more specifically, not all protest parties are automatically what is then far too readily, far too often called anti-system parties. I would want to put to you the thesis that it's not just anti-elitism that really characterizes populists. Of course, when they're in opposition, populists tend to criticize elites. But furthermore, and this is really the crucial element, they also always tend to say that they and only they represent what populists tend to call the real people, the authentic people, or also very frequently, of course, the silent majority. Now, initially, that might not sound particularly problematic or dangerous. It's not automatically the same as racism, xenophobia, and so on. But it actually has immediately two detrimental consequences for democracy. Because what follows from what is essentially a claim to a monopoly of moral representation, first of all, results in the fact that populists will always say that all other contenders for power are illegitimate. And this is not just a disagreement about policy, which of course is completely normal in a democracy. No, populists always immediately make it personal, make it, if you like, a character issue. I'm not going to repeat any of the things that Donald Trump said about his opponent in the last 16 months. I would only want to underline that in a sense he was an extreme case in this regard, but he was not an exception. It's always the case that populists will try to morally disqualify their <coughs> opponents. Secondly, and maybe less obviously, populists will also say that all those among, if you like, the people themselves, among actual citizens, who do not share their understanding of the one and only real people, and who therefore don't support the populists by definition, that all those people <coughs> might have their status as properly belonging to that people put into doubt. Just think, for instance, of Nigel Farage's speech still during the night of Brexit when he said this had been, according to him, a victory for real people. The implication of which is, of course, that the 48% who wanted to stay inside the European Union on one level, well, I'm quite real, might have their status as properly belonging to the people put into doubt. Just as a footnote, his, his now recently elected successor as the head of UKIP, of course, has precisely continued this rhetoric as saying, we are the party of real people, etc. Whereas one online commentator very nicely said, how do you spell real again? Well, it's W-H-I-T-E, something like that. But that's just a side, a side, a side remark. Maybe to underline the point, uh, and forgive me for mentioning him quite often after all, Donald Trump actually also did something which brought out this particular populist logic. Um, but it was a remark that hardly anybody picked up on, given all the racist and sexist things he has said in other contexts over the last 15, 16 months. But in a sense, it was, very, it was a very revealing statement that he made in the context of a campaign rally in May, 
when he said, I'm quoting from memory, the important thing is the unification of the people. And all the other people don't mean anything. In other words, even those who might have an American passport, who legally might be part of the people, might not count for anything, might be excluded without any particular problem or downside. This, by the way, again, if you permit me a brief footnote, also shows that when liberals were falling over themselves last month, saying, oh, now he's given this nice conciliatory speech after the victory, now he's talking about unifying Americans, now he is, well, he isn't saying much, actually. Of course, he was tweeting it. He was tweeting, again, I'm quoting from memory, we will unite like never before and win, 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 exclamation mark. This, ladies and gentlemen, is not a liberal democratic promise of reconciliation, tolerance, and an acceptance of diversity. It's actually a threat of sorts. Because for the populace to unify the people always means that you have to unify on his, or for that matter, her terms. It doesn't mean unification in the sense of let's all be together and maybe accept our diversity and differences. So what I simply want to point out is that beyond anti-elitism, there is always anti-pluralism as an essential characteristic of populists. Let me add a few more words about what I take to be widespread myths or certain types of conventional wisdom about populism that has become particularly relevant or maybe pernicious in light of the fear that in Europe some of these actors will very soon take power as well. It's a very widespread view that, yes, these might be dangerous, dangerous politicians, dangerous parties, but if we actually let them govern, the problem will somehow solve itself. Why? Because according to this, in my view, very naive liberal uh, view, all populists are protesters. All, part, all populist parties are protest parties. And so by definition, once you get to government, you can't protest anymore because logically you cannot protest against yourself once you are in power. Or a variation of this, in my view, naive liberal expectation, all these people have such unbelievably simplistic ideas about policy that on day two of their administration, it's going to become so blindingly obvious to everybody that nothing works out in practice that, again, the problem will solve itself. I think this is deeply mistaken. I think we've already had in Europe a couple of cases recently where we have observed populists in power governing specifically as populists, which is to say, if you think there's anything to my theory, as anti-pluralists. And the examples of this, and this will not surprise you, are of course primarily inside the EU, Hungary, and now to some degree Poland. In relation to the EU, of course the prime example today is Turkey, where already a couple of years ago Erdogan just to kind of you know, make his populist credentials clear, at a party congress said, we are the people, he and the AK party, and then turning to his critics inside the country, who are you? That for me is a sort of pure version of this anti-pluralist populist claim. Now, if you like, we can talk more in the discussion about what particularly populists will do when they're in power. I think one can identify a number of, if you like, patterns of what they do about the state, what they do about civil society. I'm happy to follow up on that later if you like. What I simply want to add at this point is that, again, very much contrary to a certain conventional wisdom, according to which populism is inherently anti-institutional and therefore also inherently anti-constitutional, anti-checks and balances and so on, Contrary to that view, as Viktor Orban has demonstrated to the world, populists can even write constitutions. This image, which I think is derived from certain cliched views of Latin America, namely that the populist is always, you know, 
a sort of presidential figure on a balcony with, you know, the masses in front of, well, it's usually him, not her, um, and everything is uncontrolled and you no know, institutions should constrain, constrain the populist and so on. I think this is wrong. I think populists, when they have the chance, which is to say when they have sufficient majorities and when there are no sufficiently strong countervailing powers, will take the opportunity to create constitutions to their own liking. Orban has done it. Erdogan is probably just about to do it. And what characterizes these types of constitutions is that they are what the German judge and scholar Dieter Grimm at one point called exclusive constitutions, by which he meant that they were not the product of an open, open-ended, pluralist process of constitution making that involved many different parts of society, but that it was essentially one party that decreed its exclusive vision of the real people and tried to codify, in fact, tried to constitutionalize it in its own way and to its own liking. I think that's exactly what we've seen in Hungary. I think this is more or less what we can expect to happen in Turkey next. I partly mention this because I'll come back to this point of exclusive constitutions and then the defense of a supposedly conclu uh, exclusive constitutional identity towards the very end of my, of my remarks. But for now, just a couple of words, as promised, as a sort of second chapter of the talk, about plausible hypotheses about the actual causes of populism. Allow me, at the risk of seeming overly academic, allow me two quick methodological remarks before I try to lay out what I think are plausible hypotheses about these, about these causes. I'm struck, maybe you are too, by a widespread tendency today, namely lots of people, let's just say lots of members of the liberal elite, tend to say, Look, we don't believe a word of what these populists say. They're the great simplifiers. They're the great demagogues. You know, we don't trust them. We don't believe anything they put forward. And yet, at the same time, it's striking how often when these populist leaders themselves try to sell us a story about why they are successful, we just buy it. And often these are extremely simplistic and reductionist stories about why they've been successful. People just sort of, sort of then just walk away and say, yeah, yeah, it must be about the losers of globalization. Yeah, 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 it must be about the triumph of neoliberalism. Yes, we somehow now have to accept that the entire working class has become xenophobic. They just all now hate foreigners. And these things are far from being, having been empirically established. We simply buy it because in a certain way it makes our life easier to think that there must be one clear motivation, one clear feeling, one clear sort of sociological key that answers the question how on earth all of this could have happened now, how it could have happened so quickly, and so on, and so forth. Secondly, I think we also need to bear in mind that if we ask about the causes of populism in sp specifically, and again, if you are maybe willing to come on board with my understanding of populism, we don't need to explain why, for instance, some people vote for parties that have a protectionist agenda. I mean, if you are, now I'm kind of falling into the same cliche talk, if you are a worker insecure about the future of the factory and so on, it's not such a mystery why you could possibly be tempted to vote for somebody who offers you a protectionist program. The real question, if you want to be precise, has to be why people vote for parties that are specifically populist, i.e. that deny the legitimacy of the other contenders, that say that certain people don't really belong to the people, and so on. Now, obviously, we're not going to easily specify why people might have that motivation, but I think we need to have the question, at least, as precise as possible. So, if you go along with that, then let me suggest two maybe relatively banal observations 
about why we might see specifically populism under certain circumstances. And then let me add one perhaps not so obvious, not so banal observation that is also about Europe in particular. So first of all, it seems to me prima facie that it's always easier to have populism if you already have some kind of, let's say for shorthand, Kulturkampf. If you can already find ways of saying, yes, this side is the real people, and this other side isn't the real people somehow. And this, I think, has been true, for instance, to some degree in Hungary, which made it easier for Orban. This has been true to some degree in Poland, which might have made it easier for Kaczynski. It's not the only explanation. But I think, prima facie, all other things being equal, if you already can sort of plausibly say that, yes, we are engaged in a fight between the real people and others, it makes it easier. Second, maybe even more blindingly obvious remark, it clearly must help populists if they can point to the elite with what in the eyes of their audience is at least a certain sociological plausibility. Or, to put it very bluntly, it's easier to have populism in France than in Germany. Because in France, after all, it's not such a crazy idea to say, well, there is this essentially self-reproducing elite. We all know where they got their degrees. We all know where they meet. They live in this, in this, in this capital, which unless you inherited money or win the lottery as a young person, is basically completely uh, unobtainable as a place to live, and so on and so forth. I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying as a kind of foothold for making certain claims, it does render things easier for populists. Whereas in Germany, of course, we have elites as well, but it's much harder to identify people along the lines of, oh, they all went to this university, or they all go to this particular club in Berlin, and Berlin anyway isn't really the kind of capital like London or Paris is in terms of opening up an obvious contrast between left behind other areas and then this, uh, and then this the capital. Things are changing, but as many of you remember, this famous, this famous saying, Berlin is still poor but sexy. People would never say that, you know, London or Paris are, well, never mind. Um, <laughs> so these are, I think, the two, more ob two relatively obvious preconditions for making it easier for populists. Here's the third, and I hope less obvious, thing to say. If other politicians engage in a, for shorthand, technocratic discourse, if they suggest that basically there's only one rational policy to be pursued, that to be against that policy is to reveal yourself as irrational on some level, then, ladies and gentlemen, I think it becomes a lot easier for populists to find an opening of saying, where are the people in all this? How come that the only job of citizens is essentially to nod and sign off on what these technocrats have already decided? Now, mind you, that doesn't mean that they're right about bringing the people back in, because in a certain way, even though they seem so different, technocracy and populism actually share one important feature. They are both forms of anti-pluralism. The technocrat says only one correct rational policy solution. The populist says only one authentic will of the people. Both sides don't need exchange of arguments, deliberation, debate. In fact, both sides don't even really need an institution like a parliament. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is, I think, the kind of dynamic that we've seen in Europe over the last six or seven years. That in a certain strange way, technocracy has encouraged populism. Populism, in turn, encourages technocracy because the more decision makers feel that, OK, if we have a referendum, if we leave it to the people, it's going to be a disaster. So we have to be even stricter in our discourse of there is no alternative. I hope you can see how, in the Euro crisis at least, this has led to a kind of vicious, vicious circle. So that, I think, is a more specific reason, I think, why populism has become so powerful in Europe in particular over the last couple of years. <laughs>
All right, and now to what I maybe uh, too quickly, too grandly advertised as the positive part, the third part of how one could possibly think about some counter-populist strategies. Again, allow me to preface the three points I'm about to make with two more academic, more methodological, if you like, uh, if you like, uh, if you like remarks. I'll be mainly talking about questions of strategy and, in a certain way, the self-presentation of professional politicians. And I think these are important considerations. But clearly, what matters above all, but which I cannot give you in the remaining two and a half minutes, which I probably have, um, is substantive policy offerings. It clearly would be a mistake to treat this whole thing as just a sort of PR problem. That, you know, if only we had better spin doctors, if only, you know, the European Commission could invite a couple of, you know, clever people to, you know, rearrange the narrative, reframe the narrative, you know, to make it more positive and enthusiastic or whatever, then all will be solved. No, this clearly would be the wrong, the wrong way to go. We can talk about what that substance might have to involve later on. I'm just saying that this is ultimately the most important, the most important question to, uh, to, uh, to address. Second, in a sense, prefatory remark is that, again, we should not somehow fall for this idea that populists somehow have revealed to us the real truth about society. So, so that whatever we now do by way of counter strategies basically then specifically starts to respond to what they are saying or to what we take to be a kind of revealed sociological truth about society. It's striking to me how often one now reads things along the lines of saying, look, Trump basically revealed the truth about American society, that it's full of bigoted people, full of racists, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, there are racists in the United States. But what this kind of perception, I think, completely misses is that representation is not something like a mechanical reproduction of something that is always already out there and that now has been revealed. No, it's a dynamic process where various representational offerings, of course, also shape the way, the ways in which people perceive themselves. Clearly, the tragedy of what we've seen in 2016 is that Trump somehow did manage to make a lot of people see themselves as some kind of members of something like a white identity movement. But it would be wrong to say that, oh, now this is the ultimate truth about American society, because clearly it also means that these self-perceptions can change again. And in that sense, it's not such a big mystery why some of the same people who voted for Obama in 2008 and 2012 could now possibly have voted for Trump. So that's just a cautionary note about, again, not simply buying what the populists themselves are offering us. Okay, so what are the three more positive, positive points I would like to, um, to offer to you? First of all, I think we've now had in, in a sufficient number of examples of actual engagement between so-called mainstream politicians and populists to draw at least a couple of conclusions about what to do and what not to do. It seems pretty clear by now that a gesture of total exclusion along the lines of we're not going to be on the same podium with you. We're not going to be in the same talk show with you. If you ask a question in Parliament, we're all going to walk out and not answer it. That that gesture of exclusion is bound to backfire in the sense that it's almost guaranteed to confirm the narrative which populist leaders are constantly giving to their own followers. The elites never listen. There are all these taboos which nobody's allowed to talk about, and so on and so forth. Now, to say that one has to engage then and not exclude, however, does not imply that one now simply has to engage on the terms which the populists themselves suggest. Talking with populists is not the same as talking like populists. We've had plenty of examples, probably most recently Nicolas Sarkozy in France, of how running after populists in any case, even within sort of purely strategic instrumental considerations, 
is bound not to work. Because they can always say, look, here's the original. Look at that copy. Why don't you go for the original? Which is more or less actually what Jean-Marie Le Pen already said in the, uh, in the 80s uh, at, his, at, his, at the height of his uh, success, if that's the right, if that's the right, uh, right word. However, beyond this, beyond this basically imperative not to accept the way in which populists are framing certain problems, there's also, I think, the imperative to say that if within a debate where lots of things, pretty much everything can be on the table, questions of immigration, how to solve the euro crisis, all this sort of stuff the populists want to talk about, if within a debate a populist politician starts to say things like, there might be a secret plan by Angela Merkel to replace the folk with Syrians, which, as you know, is basically a theory that originated among the extreme French right and which is now sort of circulating among populists in Europe. If somebody says that, I think democratic politicians, normal politicians, if you like, have to be extremely tough and confrontational. Not because the populist is going to say, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't realize that I was doing a conspiracy theory. They're not going to say that. But hopefully, and maybe this is a naive hope of a democratic theorist, enough citizens might watch this and say, OK, I might even like some of their program, but I don't really want to be in the same boat with conspiracy theorists. I don't really want to be in the same boat with people who, like the German IFD, constantly say that we already live in a dictatorship, or like Herr Wilders, that you know the Dutch parliament is a fake parliament, these are all fake parties, this is some Potemkin village of democracy. I think plenty of people still would want to resist those sorts of, if you like, normative political commitments. Lastly, and maybe somewhat counterintuitively, given what I've said so far, there are also important moments when one simply has to ignore populists. As I said, always engage in debates, you know, confront the issues, and so on. But there are also plenty of other issues where populists don't have it so easy. And many of these other issues are also very grave policy challenges. So what one should avoid concretely is a situation, which right now, for instance, we have in France, where the entire political discourse, as you know, turns around Marine Le Pen to the extent that she herself doesn't even have to talk anymore. Everybody is at least talking about her. Plenty of people are effectively talking for her. And I think there are plenty of other issues that people could also talk about where she doesn't have an obvious advantage in terms of you know, having particularly sharp, provocative, whatever sort of rhetoric to, uh, to offer. The same holds true, of course, and plenty of people have said this already by now, that if the next four years of American political discourse unfold along a pattern, along the lines of a pattern that Trump tweets, and then we all do this in response, and then he tweets something else, it's going to be a disaster for democratic debate. Uh, I know it's hard to ignore Trump's Twitter, uh, tweets, but there might be good moments when really it's a civic duty not to read that kind of stuff and keep our eyes somewhere, somewhere, uh, somewhere else. Second point, second strategy, and again, this might sound relatively banal, but I think there's some good empirical evidence for how this can actually work. It seems to me that one very good countermeasure is simple consistency. We have plenty of examples now of politicians in Europe who really made no concessions to populist parties, who said, look, you might not entirely like what I stand for in terms of immigration, refugee policies, whatever it might be, but I'm going to stick to my guns. And I think we can think of a number of examples where voters, majorities of voters, have really honored those sorts of commitments. And this is not as trivial a point as it might seem. Because going back to the initial image with which I began, you know, the great tsunami, the wave, the dominoes that are everywhere falling now. What that whole image tends to not make us see is that Nigel Farage didn't cause Brexit all by himself. He needed his Boris Johnson. He needed his Michael Gove. Donald Trump, I'm pretty sure, would not have 
been elected president had he stood for a third party. He needed the Republican Party, and specifically he needed his Newt Gingrich, his Chris Christie, his Rudy Giuliani, establishment figures who basically told American citizens, yes, maybe he's a bit funny, but ultimately you can vote for him. It's safe. The result being that 90% of self-identified Republican voters in the U.S. went for Trump. At the same time, only 37% of Americans thought that Trump was qualified to be president. So how do we make sense of that? Well, he needed the blessing of these establishment figures. So we need to, in a sense, get away from an image uh, which is usually encapsulated in the kind of maps of Europe you see in magazines and newspapers very often, where in every country we sort of identify the populist party, the extremist party, the dangerous party. That's important. But what that perspective misses is the interaction between those parties and mainstream parties. What it also misses is the possibility that sometimes alleged mainstream or normal parties can effectively become populist parties. Viktor Orban's Fidesz party was not always a populist party. It was a pretty nationalist, pretty conservative, but ultimately still Christian Democratic Party up until a point. Now it's clearly become a populist party. It's a party that in many ways is to the right of the officially extremist party, Jobbik. And many people don't see that because we're caught in this image of here are the extremes and the rest somehow must be the mainstream. Or just think of what is happening in Britain right now. If you listen to some of Theresa May's speeches, it seems not a crazy idea to think that she is busy reinventing the established, mainstream, normal, etc., conservative party as a version of UKIP light. It's been a while since in a European country we had sentences like, if you think you're a citizen of the world, then da 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 you're deluded, and so on and so forth. This is pretty strong stuff, and this is not the stuff that mainstream normal parties tend to give to us, usually. A less obvious way of being consistent, though, is also that you don't forever and ever say, no, we're never going to, let's say, do a coalition with what is now a populist party. You can also say, and this is to some degree happening in Austria right now, you can say, look, we don't want to forever morally disqualify you, because actually that's a populist too. But if you want to be in the political game, here's a number of criteria that you as a populist party have to fulfill. And clearly on the top of these lists of criteria, as far as I'm concerned, should be that they give up being populist parties, which is to say they give up their claim to a monopoly of moral representation. Now, if they do that, there might still be plenty of things which many of you, maybe all of you and I, wouldn't like. If, for instance, the German IFD ceases to be a populist party, but it remains you know, very tough on immigration, as the cliche goes, has a very conservative family policy. I don't know about you. I wouldn't like it. But if we're serious about pluralism, it means that there's going to be stuff out there that we don't like, because pluralism cannot just mean all the stuff that we liberals like. I'm, I'm just including you as liberals now in a uh, horrible, preemptive, uh, presumptuous gesture. Um, and then we basically have to put up with that. But the precondition is that they, in a sense, also accept Pluralism. That, in a sense, is the deal that has to be made if these parties are to be incorporated. But the thought is, and again, maybe this is a naive hope, that under certain circumstances, an incorporation of some of these parties can ultimately be a certain gain for democracy. I think there are countries in Europe where this has happened, although not along the lines which I was suggesting just now. I'm thinking of Greece and Spain, which are usually in the sort of journalistic narrative subsumed under you know, the narrative of, oh, crisis of democracy, crisis of representation, everything is going to hell. Plus, you know, we also have these horrible left-wing parties like Syriza and Podemos. I think the story is exactly the other way around. The story is that these political systems, at least at the national level, found ways of representing the real political and economic conflict in southern Europe, which 
for shorthand, is between austerity and anti-austerity, they found a way to reflect that within the system. Doesn't mean that you know, Podemos is going to win, but the definition of democracy is not that everybody wins. The definition of democracy is that everybody has a chance to make their case, to organize, to try to convince other people, and then if you feel you've had that chance, you are more likely to give losers consent, as opposed to thinking we live in a post-democracy where no matter what I do, I'm going to have, as in Greece and Spain before 2011 or so, two massively corrupt parties which basically never really change anything might seem a relatively banal observation, but just think about it historically for a second. It's by no means obvious that young people, especially in 2011, 2012, decided, okay, we don't just do movement of the squares. We don't just do street demonstrations. We actually organize parties. It would have been perfectly plausible to say that, no, we have given up entirely on our system. We only do basically street stuff. Or, if you think back to decades not so long ago in Europe, it would have been perfectly plausible in a certain way for some of these young people to say, we have to take up arms. We have to start killing members of the Troika because our system is so rotten, it's so undemocratic, we have to do things differently. And instead, they basically entered the system, organized parties, and ultimately achieved a certain gain for representative democracy. Now, obviously, you can tell me in response, that's very nice, but I can vote for Tsipras 10 more times, and nothing's ever going to change. That's true, but that only shows that the problem here is not at the level of the Greek national democratic system. The problem here is at the level of the EU, where this conflict between austerity and anti-austerity cannot be reflected in the system, which is the reason why what cannot be expressed as opposition within the EU becomes opposition to the EU. And we can talk more about the structural problem later on if you, if you like. I'm only trying to suggest that this might be one more positive avenue along which one could, along which one could think. <laughs> Lastly, and sticking with the EU for just a second, I said earlier that populists can govern as populists, as anti pluralists and that essentially they end up taking their countries in a more or less authoritarian direction. And I think one of the most tragic failings of the EU today, where it sort of seems to have reached a limit, is precisely its inability to confront these sorts of governments. That in theory, of course, as, as, as you know, there are mechanisms, possible sanctions. It's not as if nobody ever thought about an EU member going rogue, so to speak, but for all kinds of reasons, which we can also talk, more, talk about more if you wish, in this case, the relevant politicians have all decided that they can't really do anything about this. And the this in this case really, I think, goes to the moral core of the European project in a way that, in this, at least I think, something like the euro doesn't. The euro might just be a failed policy. I mean, catastrophic consequences potentially, but ultimately just a policy. So Angela Merkel's famous sentence, if the euro fails, Europe fails, by the way, a great example for technocratic language, um, I think on one level it's just empirically false. But if you have authoritarian countries within the EU, then I think we have good reasons to say yes, then Europe really has failed in a deep, in a deep sense. As I said, we can talk more about specifically what might be done. What I would simply underline now, which is less obvious, I think, than, uh, than other elements in the story here, is that again we have, if I may use that evil term one more time, we have a story of collaboration. We have the European People's Party, which has decided to shield Viktor Orban from really effective outside criticism, from really effective outside measures for, at this point, six and a half years. That, I think, is a massive party political and I would also say moral failing. And at the very least, I think what we as citizens can do is to hold those who are responsible for that failing, those who decided that, yes, it was okay to have a populist, in many ways, undemocratic regime or regimes, if you count Poland as well, in the EU, that ultimately this isn't such a big problem. 
I think we should make more of this. I think we should push there. We should not just always be fixated on the Salvinis with their, you know, uh, to, with their tweets or Trump with his tweets and so on. We should look at mainstream actors because in a certain way we are also, again, I'm assuming you're all liberals, prove me wrong, we're much more likely to influence those actors in a certain way. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan Werner, for this uh, talk. We're open now to questions from the floor. There's one already. And there's a microphone, uh, which Julie is uh, handing out. Yes. First of all, thank you for a uh, very inspiring speech. Um, you mentioned uh, several causes uh, behind uh, uh, populism. But these causes have always been present. Nevertheless, we see the rise of populism very recently. Aren't there any very crucial and important mistakes that the mainstream or moderate establishment has made recently which caused or triggered the rise of populism right now? Thank you. Yes, why don't you answer each question? Okay. Yes. Okay. yes, so I, I agree that we need to be as specific as possible. Again, there's a tendency to homogenize this phenomenon and say that, oh, we see it everywhere, so it must have the same causes everywhere, or it must have always been there. No. Clearly, above all, we need to look at different national constellations. The reasons for Jörg Haider are not the same as the reasons for Jean-Marie Le Pen, for instance. But we should also look at, despite this warning about homogenization, perhaps larger structural causes, which I didn't mention in the, in the, in the talk. And what I would say on that account is that I think our time, more than previous times, is characterized by a fundamental conflict, which, for shorthand, comes down to, on the one hand, those who desire, in the broadest sense, more openness, which can take the form, in the more obvious form, of cultural and economic globalization, but also the less obvious form of more openness towards let's say, ethnic, sexual, and religious minorities at home, so it doesn't have to be the international as such. And then on the other hand, those who, by contrast, basically want some kind of closure. So it's the kind of conflict that has been identified by scholars like Hans-Peter Krisi from this country and, and others. And I think the diagnosis is essentially right. I think this conflict is, in a sense, as real as previous conflicts or cleavages that structured our politics, capital and labor, countryside and city, and so on. And the important thing is that it's the kind of conflict where populists can come in and say, yes, this is our topic. We always do identity politics, exclusionary identity politics. I'm not saying that all identity politics is populist. That's not true. But we do a certain kind of identity politics that seems to answer some of these issues. We decide who belongs and who doesn't belong. And if, by contrast, our debates revolved around different issues, if we took global warming much more seriously, if our main conflicts have to do with, let's say, bioethical issues, stem cell research, reproductive rights, and so on, it's not obvious to me that populists would dominate these debates. Yes, they might say that don't trust the experts, the experts are part of the elite, but beyond that, I'm not sure, sure they would have anything that particularly sort of uh, is, 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 is working for them. So in that sense, yes, I think there is a larger structural, uh, structural reason. Again, it comes down to then say, look, other parties need to be able to speak to that conflict in a convincing, in a coherent, in a coherent way, and hopefully move people also, but that's of course my, my personal view, move them as much as possible towards the openness pole of that, of that conflict. Okay. There, was a, there was a microphone. Uh... Yes. yes thank, thank you also for your very enlightening and clear uh, speech. I would like also to come back to, to your second part of the speech on, on the causes. And I was uh, wondering if here, 
Karl Polanyi and the great transformation cannot be from, of some help to understand the, the contemporary situation. As in the past decades, we had again the reemergence of the utopia of a self-regulating market. And I was wondering if uh, this um, populism wave was not the expression of a counter movement of, um, within societies against the imposition of such an utopia. I would like to have your opinion on that. Well, look, in general, Polanyi always helps. It's never a bad idea. Um, I would, and in a sense, I would, I would agree, because also, as, as hopefully became clear from what I was, was saying a second ago, yes, in a sense, that desire for closure easily relates to some of Polanyi's famous, famous theses. At the same time, I would shy away from what I see sometimes as too quick a causal explanation that basically says, ah, here's neoliberalism, and bang, it determines the emergence of populism in one way or another. I think that is very debatable. I think in many ways it's actually wrong because we see a whole variety, variety of outcomes. We see a whole range of movements that basically don't take a populist form. Again, if you, if you think that, no, I'm wrong, and Podemos and Syriza actually are populist, and they, as many of you know, they actually even call themselves populist in the case of Podemos, then you know the, 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 uh, the argument might be, might be different. But I think we need, to, we need to bear in mind that there's a variety of outcomes. It's not true that the worst off actually vote for populists. The worst off in the US did not vote for Donald Trump. Uh, the worst off in Germany do not vote for the AfD. Uh, the whole kind of what's the matter with Kansas argument also in terms of, oh yeah, yeah, they're sort of the worst off, plus they have these cultural uh, fixations and ideas which make them vote against their economic interests. That's empirically not true either. So I think I would go along with Ed as a kind of macro image to start with, but I think again we need to be very specific about the different outcomes and what causes different outcomes in different contexts. Uh, where is the, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, three questions if I may. The, the first one is, where do you see the, the more, more likely scenario uh, for the outcome of the Italian referendum? Uh, what are the, the uh, expectations uh, in your eyes? The second one is the IFD in, uh, in Germany uh, took as base for uh, the populism the immigration issue. But are there any other issues, uh, unlike Italy and France, where there is a, a economic problem? But the, the question is, it's, uh, it's surprising to see such a rise in such a short period of time just based on one issue. So I, I, uh, some clarification would help. The third issue, the third question was, as of late, we saw that the technocracy of uh, Brussels is rejected, is, is clearly rejected. The, the, you know, the, uh, even among non-populist people are saying, look, are you governing well? So if the ball comes back to the national leaders to lead Europe, are we not losing a little bit of momentum in the sense that every leader in their own country has their own, his or her own agenda to deal with? So where do we go with leadership of Europe from here? Yes, three questions. So I generally don't make predictions, especially not about the future. But um, <laughs> what I simply would say, and I think it's very much conventional wisdom at the end of this week, is of course that like in France with the no in 2005, Yes, you can interpret it as a kind of populist backlash of sorts, but it doesn't amount to any positive project. So it doesn't follow that, oh, now clearly populists will come to power because look, you know, they succeeded in this negative endeavor. It's at least not clear to me how, you know, Grillo or Salvini would kind of work together or who, how magically you would now have a big, a big populist party coming, coming to a plus. In the case of Grillo, I think it's, it's much more complicated anyway. I mean, he has said things which clearly do fit my understanding of populism, when he said, you know, we 
we have to, we, you know, we, we deserve 100% in Parliament. I mean, that's about as anti-plural as, as, it, as it gets. Um, but he's also said many other things which point in a different direction. So I think uh, interesting things can, can, can happen, which I know is not a satisfying answer because we all know that, but I don't think much can be said beyond that at this, at this point. On the IFD, let me go back to one of my counter strategies. So many people now say that, look, Merkel at least was very consistent. And I think that has been admirable in many, in many ways. But I think it's a fine line between being consistent and falling back into a, or falling into a stance of there is no alternative. Because that's always been sort of her default mode in a certain way. And I think unfortunately in a certain way it also happened with the refugee issue. That she started to say, look, this is beyond debate basically. This can only happen like this now. And I think you could have offered very good moral reasons, also strategic instrumental reasons for keeping Europe together to explain what she was doing and still being consistent and yet avoid this, again, in a sense technocratic, but now with morality discourse where you say, it's only my way and there's no other way you can debate any, any other options. I think that can lead to a justified sense among citizens who argue, aha, so democracy is only if we have so, four social democratic parties in parliament who all agree on this one issue. So the hope at least would be that part of the enormous success, comparatively, of the IFD has partly also been based on people who really were just trying to protest, who are not all racist, who are not lost for democracy, who are not, in Hillary Clinton's infamous term, deplorables in that, in that sense. Of course, it's conceivable, again, just speculating, it's conceivable that ultimately a, sh a space to the right of the Christian Democrats has permanently opened up. People who have very conservative ideas about the family, people who have you know, a particular idea of the nation that is you know, ethnic or at least very conservative in certain other, other regards. Again, I wouldn't like it, but I think it would be a mistake to say that, oh, that's ipso facto undemocratic, or this couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly exist. The question really is, do they cease to be populist? Do they cease to basically constantly tell people there is something wrong with our system? Because if I may just underline that point again, even when they're in opposition, they constantly tend to do that. And it goes beyond normal criticism of a government. It goes beyond normal protest. It's not an accident that so frequently, not always, but very frequently, a populist party that loses a vote tends to contest that outcome. Remember, we saw it in Austria in May, in May this year. And the reason it's not an accident is that, in a sense, they always have a structural challenge. Because on the one hand, they say that we and only we represent the people. And at the same time, how can it be that they lose an election? Well, the very term silent majority gives the answer because the majority is silent because someone or something prevented that majority from expressing itself. If the silent majority could really speak, the populists would always be in power. So by definition, the reason that they couldn't speak is because the elites were doing something you know, behind the scenes. So that's why, in a sense, one so frequently finds a link between populism and a certain type of conspiracy theory. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we're not allowed to criticize our election systems, our institutions. That's totally fine, of course. What you can't do is what populists essentially always end up doing, which is to say, because we didn't win, our system is somehow in question or is somehow democratically doubtful. That is not an acceptable argument. On the third issue, what, what, can, what, can, what can Brussels do? Fortunately, I have another three hours to, to answer this question. Eh? <laughs> um, what, I would simply, what I would simply say is that uh, I think we should reject this image of here's Brussels and here are national leaders. I mean, Europe works always through member states and national leaders. It's not as if there's some separate entity out there, you know, which decides things completely on its, completely on its, on its own. So it depends what they do together. That's the first point. And the second point is that, as I was trying to hint during the talk, Prima facie, I think it is a plausible idea to continue to go in this direction that was very tentatively, very timidly adopted in 2014 when people said, okay, European elections should really be elections, as in you have a range of choices, you have some options, 
And hopefully, even if you lose, you're going to give what political scientists with their usual uh, gentleness call loser's consent, because you felt that you had the chance to somehow be involved. Now, to make that meaningful, well, there need to be meaningful choices. Uh, of course, it sort of has a disastrous impression, creates a disastrous impression. If after the election, where supposedly you had a choice, you know, uh, Jean-Claude sits there together with his friend Martin, and, you know, they're completely d'accord about, about, about all problems, and you realize, okay, that wasn't really a choice. You know, it's sort of basically one party, more or less. And Brussels maybe to some degree needs to be able to do more really on its own, which comes down to well-known ideas about raising taxes specifically for the Commission, for instance, to address economic imbalances within the Eurozone, such that somebody could credibly say, here's my program, here's what I'm going to do from a social democratic, Christian democratic, from a left-wing Tsipras point of view, whatever it might be, if you elect me. I think prima facie, that remains a plausible way to go. But it's a risk. It's a risk that many people don't want to take. And the worry is that if we don't take that risk, we're going to end up with something much worse somewhere down the line. Young lady here. Thank you. I stand up so everyone can see me. So uh, you criticize populist leaders for not being plural enough. But do you think the current system established mainly by liberals, is that plural enough, especially in terms of gender, race, uh, ethnicity, uh, and uh, actually class, most importantly. Okay, we have a few uh, black company managers, but once they obtain power, they actually don't care about uh, the rest of the black people. Yes, we have Obama, but what exactly did he bring uh, change in terms of you know, black people in Africa? Can we really talk about real change? Plus, when we actually talk about real change, Bernie Sanders, for example, he was proposing real policy alternatives, but he was blocked by powerful corporate leaders. So who is going to bring an offer and what uh, exactly policy alternative? Because you were talking about policy alternatives. Thank you. So this, I think, is, is, is pushing an important, an important point because if you're at all willing to go with the argument that, yes, populism really is anti-pluralism, then it might be tempting to say that, okay, all we have to do is somehow assert pluralism. But it's not as simple as that. We have to do some more work, and you're in a sense pushing us to do that work, because pluralism can mean, obviously, many different things. And it can mean, in a sense, something as simple as the empirical fact of diversity. It can mean perhaps difference and diversity as a value, but many people would contest that, and they would say, look, it's not a first order political value such as liberty and equality. Or it could mean basically a richer normative commitment to say that in contemporary societies, we're gonna have to find fair terms of living together with people who in many ways are different, who have very different ideas of the good life, uh, who, again, we might not particularly like in terms of their lifestyles or what they do and so on, but still, it's something that we have to basically engage with and we have to engage with it in, in light of a commitment to overall fairness. The third one would be my preferred answer at, at an abstract level to this, uh, to, this, to this question. And notice, in a sense, because there's been a debate about this, as many of you will know, in the U.S. recently, that this does not amount to a rejection of so-called identity politics. Some of you might be familiar with the notion that, oh, the problem was that, you know, Hillary Clinton was making too many gestures towards minorities, and Democrats spent all this time talking about transgender bathrooms when they should have been talking about real people, i.e. white working class, because they're the only real people, and so on. I think this is, this is, uh, this is a mistake, because on one level, it's just conceptually wrong to think that we can neatly separate identity and interests. Interests are formed in light of certain identities. All modern politics is both about identity and interests. Secondly, not all forms of identity politics are the same. So Black Lives Matter is not on the same level as the Klan, let's say. Even though, yes, on some super abstract level, you could say, oh, they're both about identity. But the difference is there's an identity politics that says we and only we are the people, 
That is the populist form of identity politics, which is anti-pluralist and ultimately always anti-democratic. And there is a form of identity politics that essentially says we are also the people. And that doesn't raise that claim to basically an exclusive moral monopoly of representation of the whole. So these claims for inclusion, I think, are, again, something that is completely normal, that can be based on very different identities, and that's something that one has to, one way or the other, respond to. And, last point, one also, in a sense, has to respond to it in such a way that it doesn't look like a sort of just mechanical mode of inclusion. Because sometimes, if, if I say, we are also the people, then, you know, the, the assumption is, okay, so yeah, we didn't recognize that, you know, now we recognize that you've been neglected or uh, you were sort of outside the political process in some sense, now we include you. But of course, at least under certain circumstances, the inclusion will lead to a profound change in the system itself. It's not a mechanical inclusion where everything else then stays the same, and you've simply added sort of more people in a kind of mechanical additive fashion, but you might have to change the system as a whole in certain ways. Now, that doesn't answer your question about, about, about Bernie Sanders and why people might be, might be, uh, might be, uh, might be excluded on the basis of, on the basis of class. Um, all I would say, again, trying to be at least a bit more hopeful, uh, is that if you look at, if you look at, uh, if you look at, for shorthand, millennials, um, I think it should be good news that these people, you know, clearly went for Sanders first and then also went for Hillary Clinton. Clearly they, you know, they organized parties like, like Podemos, which clearly distinctly is a young people's party. And they even go for, oh, God forbid, crazy, absolutely unelectable people like Jeremy Corbyn. So in that sense, I think we should not be complacent. It's not like, oh, time will solve all these problems. But especially in light of some recent, I think, flawed empirical studies, which have said, oh, young people are losing faith in democracy. I think the story is exactly the other way around. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Professor Mueller, for that. Uh, for those enlightening remarks. Uh, I'm a historian by training, and I also don't predict the future. We like predicting the past. And I was thinking more in terms of your solutions, and specifically about coalitions. And uh, my question was that, how do you know that in a certain coalition, people will hold on to the promises that they've made before joining it? Think about the leader in early 1930s in Germany who promised that he'll be a part of a coalition, but ended up doing something very different. In terms of India also, there have been several coalitions which break up, which implode, and cause a lot of unstability in the political regime. So who will hold on to you once you've promised that you've left your populist leanings, become a part of the coalition, and then come back to your original color, as it were? Thank you. There are no guarantees in democracy. So at the same time, I think we have to remember that at least in some countries, uh, some of these historical examples, they wouldn't have been able to run anyway. They might have been, you know, they, they would be outlawed today. They wouldn't be in the game in the first place. And secondly, I think by now many people have realized that, okay, the moderation through inclusion hypothesis, which, you know, people had with, you know, the BJP or also with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in 2011 very strongly. Okay, it's not as simple as that. We really have to think a lot more about these criteria. You really have to kind of do a lot more hard work in terms of thinking about incentives. And basically, if nevertheless then people break with their promises, try to make it as costly as possible. So, I mean, that's just an appeal to professional politicians, but it's also an appeal to us. Because if we think of real world examples, of course, very often there is quite some quite strong pressure then from the base of the more mainstream, more normal quote unquote party to say, oh, don't do that. Or do that, but only if you know we, they fulfill the following criteria. So in that sense, it's not it's not a mechanical process that you know has to unfold one way, one way or the, or the other. There is some room for politics, which is to say some room for creatively trying to control these these situations. Thank you. A question at the back there. Sorry. Th thank you very much for, for your um, Sorry. presentation. A very simple, not simple, so, but so one I question. Mean, 
Oh, oh, there. Yes. Um, in this highly complex and dynamic world, what would be your definition of a just society? Thank you. What, what time does this building close? <laughs> Ten minutes, okay. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to repeat what I, what I tried to say earlier in, in, uh, in, in response to an earlier question, that I think the, the, the question about justice in this context has to be answered by saying that you have to find fair terms of living together, which means you maximize recognition, you maximize, in the, case, in the context we were talking about, minority rights. You don't put a sort of limit to inclusion or emancipation in the way that sometimes, again, if I think about the American debate that's unfolding right now, many people are sort of gesturing at along the lines of saying, yeah, yeah, but minorities should shut up for a little while, you know, because we've done so much for you already. Or, you know, isn't equality enough? What do you mean equal pay, you know, on top of that? So, I mean, that's not a real-world example, but you, you know what I'm getting at. So I think that has to be a principled, principled uh, commitment, and that's an, ongoing, that's an ongoing process, and that's an ongoing process that citizens themselves have to be involved in. So I'm reluctant to say, you know, here's now my favorite blueprint, you know, I'm a Rawlsian, I'm a Dworkinian, whatever it might be. That's simply, you know, what everybody has to, has to, has to, has to accept. In terms of fairness, as also a principled way of avoiding populism, that's something that citizens themselves have to work out. And hopefully they will sort of come around to the right attitudes, ultimately. The gentleman there. Uh, well, thank you. Um, well, we are talking about the limits of Europe and Turkey has been waiting at the limits for the last 50 years, it looks like. And trying to negotiate last 10 years. And now we have um, a populist uh, party in uh, place uh, who actually operates around religion and sort of blames when you go against them that you're sort of godless. And then the other thing is that a, a fair election on 7 June uh, last year has been overturned uh, to another election failure of the other mainstream parties to come together to a sort of a underlining of the populism. And the other thing is that when Turkey was a little different than this without a populist party and mainstream politicians running, Europe always sort of put Turkey at the bay and then now has to work with a populist party in Turkey because of some other reasons, especially migration. So. So w what you. is your question, sir? How do you see that? How, how do you see the whole connection of religion and uh, not taking Turkey on board on time and re re redoing an election when it was already fair? So how it works with... So let me, let me say two things. One is that um, the EU can be criticized for many things, but I don't think the EU, in a sense, caused Erdogan to become an all-out authoritarian. I think we would make it too easy for ourselves if we said, I mean, you didn't say that, I know, but if we said now, okay, uh, Turkey was this wonderfully open and pluralist society, and then Erdogan came along and screwed everything up. Or Venezuela was this perfectly egalitarian, quasi-social democratic paradise, and then Chavez came along and screwed everything up. Um, at least in some, in, in, for some periods, I think it's clear that the initial reaction to figures like Erdogan and Chavez made things a lot worse. Now, they may have always turned out to be authoritarians sooner or later. We don't, we don't know. But again, we need to look at the dynamic between other actors and the people who then, in a sense, become more radical and come out as all-out all out, uh, populists. So that's all I would say in terms of how we should construe that, construe that story. In terms of repeating a fair election, well, I think this perfectly fits the image that I've been trying to paint for you of populists. They don't respect procedures. They alre always already know 
the right election outcome. In a sense, if you think about how they also treat a referendum, you know, which they very often call for, it's not that they want an open-ended process of deliberation and debate among citizens to find out what people empirically are actually thinking. No, the modus operandi is something like, first you posit a kind of symbolic construction of the real people, then you deduce from that symbolic construction the single authentic will of the real people, and then in a third step, you say like Trump did at the convention in July, I am your voice. But notice how in that whole process, nobody else has really spoken. Only the populist has really spoken. Or an extreme example of this, of this logic. Um, think of Viktor Orban's so-called referendum in Hungary on October 2nd. You recall the question was, can Brussels settle migrants in Hungary? Never mind that that was illegal from the beginning, because that question couldn't have been legally posed. The fact that nobody really opposed it among the institutions within Hungary is yet further evidence how much democracy has already deteriorated. But you also recall that Orban didn't get his quorum, so it was also invalid. Now, Orban couldn't say what Hofer could say in Austria. The system was rigged, because after all, he himself had been rigging it. He himself had spent close to $40 million on a hate campaign against migrants. But it doesn't matter. You can always find a way to basically invalidate, from the populist point of view, the procedural outcome. Because Orban just simply went on to say that the 3.3 million Hungarians who had voted no, which was the right answer, according to the symbolic construction of the people, they were the real people. Everybody who had stayed at home, silent majority, had actually implicitly, of course, agreed with the real people. How could they not? And then there was this tiny, annoying majority, uh, minority of people who probably had been paid by Soros or you know, some, some story along those lines. So even though the procedural story worked completely against him, it didn't prevent the populists from then saying, I have a great popular mandate, the first real popular mandate against, as the phrase always goes, migrants in Europe, and I'm now going to go to Brussels on a great anti-Brussels crusades against what Orban always calls the liberal nihilists who dominate, who dominate Brussels. So in a sense, we're never going to win against populists by saying, oh, but you know, if we put our faith in procedures, it's going to basically invalidate some of their claims. And that is a disillusioning thought, also against the background of all the people who are right now saying, oh, don't worry too much about the US, because checks and balances procedures are basically going to prevent the worst. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, perhaps. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> Ms. Korabjova, yes. Thank you indeed, it was thought provoking. Um, I would like to go back to the causes you mentioned because there were many questions about that and maybe I, I got it incorrectly, but you said precisely that there are some places or some countries that are more vulnerable in face of populism because you said that something was already there. But doesn't it mean that there are other countries who are, that are in a way resistant to this threat. Because I believe that it's another liberal illusion because I believe that populism is not about the content of the message but about the techniques of finding weak points. And the list is not exhaustive. So they, they are just trying to find with what they can work in this particular situation. And it leads me to the second question. Sorry, but I have to ask it. Uh, going back to the electorate, going back to people who vote for populists, I do love the idea that you are not buying these simple explanations. And I don't like the idea that there are some advanced people who are critically engaged and, you know, advanced, and there are this sort of silent majority who are buying all these simple messages. Uh, but I would rather think that Populism is very affecting in, effective in appealing in some, to something in each of us. So it's not a division in the society between different kinds of people, but it's rather about appealing to different sides of every person. And in this sense is an alternative proposal, alternative to the European idea that you have to work on yourself, that you have to uh, 
th that you have to shy out to disclose your ugly features of character, that you have to participate in public life, that you have to make your own judgments and kind of value the, you know, all the claims and all this. So basically you have to work a lot. And this is an alternative proposal. You don't have to. You don't have to shy out. You can be racist, you can be xenophobic, you can deliver responsibility on the big father and something like that. Uh, because, um, again, I do agree that this electorate was not there before, but populism is a performative action. By these actions, they are constructing the electorate, and now it's real. So it's not the problem how to oust them, but what to do with this reality, this new reality of people, how to persuade them that in terms of crisis you still have to suffer and work on yourself and, and on the public good. Thank you. So this is what I think in the technical political science literature is now becoming known as the problem of the inner Trump, which we all have to confront at, uh, at some, point, uh, some point or other. Okay, let me, let me take the two questions in, 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 in order. Um, so I, I hope I didn't come across as offering some kind of neo-orientalist story about all these, you know, poor Eastern European countries. They have Kultur come, they're so far behind, they haven't understood democracy, that's why we have populist regimes in Hungary and Poland and so on. No, it can happen in all kinds of, it can happen in all kinds of contexts. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not an indication of, oh, you haven't really understood uh, democracy. A lot of the outcomes are very contingent. It was not obvious in 2010 that Orban really was going to go all the way in terms of new constitution, systematic rebuilding of the, uh, of the institutions, mass clientelism, suppression of civil society with the argument that if there's protest, uh, it's not really civil society, it's funded by outsiders uh, in the way that Putin, of course, uh, pioneered, which symbolically is very important for populists, because again, by definition, it cannot be true that the people themselves are rising up against their one and only authentic representative. So it has to be shown that it's really the CIA, Shorosh, or in the case of Erdogan, it's Lufthansa, which is, you know, sponsoring the Gezi protest because they don't want Turkish Airlines to get this other hub, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, no, it's not a joke. I mean, it's, it's symbolically very important for these actors to demonstrate that these can't really be authentic citizens. Uh, it can't be an authentic protest from civil, civil society. So I think we've seen this in many contexts, and we've even seen I mean, I can't prove this to you empirically, but I, but I think they're good indicators uh, that this is happening. We've even seen a shift in political language in, in contexts where whatever one said about the political culture, it wasn't obvious that populism was a strong factor. I'm thinking again of the UK. You all recall that by now infamous, infamous cover of the Daily Mail, when they, when they depicted these three judges, um, I mean, you wonder why they didn't, didn't give their personal addresses as well in a, in a year when one politician has already been shot by a, a Daily Mail reader. And then they said, enemies of the people. And as some commentators, I think, shrewdly pointed out, the, the very expression, the people, was not really very prominent in British public discourse. Of course, you would talk about class. Uh, you would talk about the various nations that constituted the United Kingdom. There were all kinds of ways of structuring political conflicts with different ascriptive or not ascriptive group identifications. But the people was not a typical thing that you would talk about in the UK. And all of a sudden, you know, this seems to be gaining momentum. And of course, massively pushed by people like Farage and, and, and others. So I think we can... We can Everybody is vulnerable, I think, is, 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 is the bottom line what I, or what I'm basically trying to say. On the second, on the second issue, I think it's, 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 it's very complicated. And I would be reluctant to say, oh, we're going to have a nice division between here are people who are rational and want to cooperate and so on, and then there are these, you know, sort of our populist id, you know, which these people appeal to somehow, which can come out under certain, certain circumstances. And I worry about this partly because Again, if you read a lot of commentary today, including in you know, academic literature, what seems to be happening is a sort of very unconscious resurrection of cliches from 19th century mass psychology. Gustave Le Bon is kind of turning in his grave saying, yes, I already told you that the masses are irrational. They're all waiting for the great demagogue to seduce them. Plus, they're, of course, the masses are always feminine and so on and so forth. And 
at the very least, I would say that rather than operating with you know good good self, bad self, we we should say that look, I mean everything is always mixed up, reason and emotions, the very division between oh these people are resentful and angry and so on, even though that can seem like a neutral description of sorts, isn't neutral at all, because people have emotions for a reason. Nobody is just angry just like that, and at the very least we should accept the possibility that if we talk to people about their emotions, they're able to articulate the reasons for their emotions. doesn't mean that we have to accept them, but at least that gets us into a conversation. Whereas if we basically rest content with, you know, what now are all the usual cliches you read in all newspapers every day, resentment, anger, Wutbürger, and so on and so forth, we're never even going to get to that point of talking about, about reasons. So I know that doesn't really answer your question, but I think I would at least sort of offer a different framing of how we could, of how we could, think, about, uh, could think about these voters. And always bear in mind that it's not preordained that it has to come out in a populist vein. If you think about how often now people are playing up the fact that, oh, look, this seems to be a new version of rural versus city. Yes, empirically, that seems to be pretty plausible in many contexts. But it doesn't mean that it has to come out as a populist opposition. It could have come out in different, in different ways. Some of you may remember that you know, we used to have, God forbid, you know, peasants' parties in Europe and smallholders' party and so on and so forth. And that was one way of addressing this conflict entirely without populism. Thank you very much. Well, it, uh, I would like to thank Jan Werner for uh, taking these questions and for his talk, and I think we have an excellent beginning for the conference, which will take place tomorrow. And uh, please join me in uh, applauding uh, Jan Werner.